Computership in the School of Computing at the National University of Singapore, India. His research interests lie at the intersection of quantum mechanics and artificial intelligence. Before joining NUS in 2017, he received MS and PhD from Rice University, co advised by Dr. Sudhir Chakravarti from uh, IIT Bombay and Moshe Bharti. His thesis work received the 2018 Ralph Bird Award for the best PhD thesis in engineering and 2014 Outstanding Master Thesis Award from Vienna Center of Algorithms, IBM PhD Fellowship, and Best Student Paper Award at CC 2015. He graduated with Bachelor of Technology with Honors in Computer Science and Engineering from IIT Bombay. Since then, he has uh, won various uh, recognitions and awards. Uh, including ACM, B-Sky, TOR, and FM City Journey. So, uh, all of you who have uh, studied uh, algorithms course must have known about uh, NP class of problems, right? But uh, you, it will be uh, surprising for you to know that um, like most of the problems that we have in the real world, they are rather NP class rather than non NP. So is that a problem? Uh, how, is, uh, how we propose to solve that problem? Let's hear from Kuldeep Mel and solve the mystery. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot uh, to the organizers for having me here. It's always great to be back to your alma mater. I'm going to be presenting an overview of the field in which um, I have been working on, where I got my start here at IIT Bombay. Um, and the story uh, goes for a long, long time. Uh, we can go all the way back to uh, ancient Indians, Chinese, and Greek philosophers um, <coughs> grappling about how, how should you reason about if you are given facts. So here's one of the syllogisms that is very popular. If you knew that all Greeks are human and you knew all humans are mortal, then what allows people to conclude that all Greeks are mortal? Philosophers would argue for a long time trying to find uh, rules that you can apply on. You would argue for a long time trying to find patterns in the language that allow you to uh, conclude such statements, but it wasn't until um, the late 19th, uh, 19th century when George Boole, a mathematician and logician in Ireland, figured out that it's all about using symbols. So what you should be doing is to assign symbols to the classes and once you assign symbols to the classes, for example here, if you assign the symbol G to Greeks, H to humans and M to mortal, once you assign symbols it just reduces to doing a algebra, there is nothing about the words that uh, matter anymore. You just apply the rules of algebra and you will be able to conclude that G implies uh, N. So the big conceptual leap that was made by uh, Bull's uh, formalization was that you can reduce the entire problem to reasoning over algebra. So you go from this language where the precision is very hard to uh, obtain to a language where everything is precise and you can ru use rules of algebra. And once you apply the rules of, once you reduce to uh, the rules of algebra, now the question becomes, if I give a set of statements, can I conclude a statement such as G implies N? If I give you the uh, statement G implies H and H implies M, can I conclude G implies M? And this would require one to apply the rules of algebra in a smart manner to be able to derive such a conclusion. You can also look at the contrapositive of this question that once I tell you two statements, is it possible that G implies M is not true? Okay, so asking is it ever possible that this is not true? If the answer is no, then G implies M is always true. The importance of this question was very soon realized after the proposal came forward. Uh, and here is William Jevons, who is usually credited as uh, the founding father of uh, modern marginal utility theory. 
going at that time, realizing the importance and trying to come up with uh, the set of rules. There were more manual rules because he realized that it's going to be really hard to reason about. So he published a set of rules and the ideas that you can use to do, derive such conclusions. First, so what is the problem in its uh, at its core? You are given an expression, right? In this case, we had an expression over G, H, and M. And you want to know, is there an assignment to these variables so that the expression evolves to 0, uh, expression evolves to 1 or not? So here is the problem uh, in its well, uh, in the simplicity, so I have an expression here on four variables x1, x2, x3 and x4 and if you stare at it long enough, I hope you will agree with me that assigning x1 to 0, x2 to 0, x3 to 1 and x4 to 1 would indeed make this expression evaluate to 1. So, this earlier problem of reasoning you can reduce to saying that can it, is it ever possible that something is uh, evaluates to 1. If you find such an assignment, then you can conclude uh, about the earlier statements you had, right. So, how hard such a method can be? So, I am Schroeder, um, who is one of the uh, giants of modern mathematical logic, went on to claim uh, in the 19th century that coming up with a method that could obtain these consequences. So, in today's modern computer science terms, we would say coming up with an algorithm would be the ultimate goal of mathematics and logic. So, think about in 19th century realizing that this is going to be, this is a central problem and one should work really hard on it. Uh, fast forward about 100 years, uh, we are past the World War II, uh, there is a, a cold war on the two fronts and the agencies soon realize that if you want to intercept what the other uh, front is trying to communicate, it might uh, have to do with doing similar reasoning. So, the uh, work on code breaking and all led NSA to realize the importance of it. So, what NSA is a national security agency in US, they funded uh, the work of uh, Martin Davis along with Putnam and ask them to uh, say that, well, do you have some ideas about trying to solve this problem? So, here are, here is the series of papers, the first report that was not published for a long time and the following papers they published along with Logman and Loveland uh, who were at NYU. So, the algorithm they could come up for this problem was to say that, well, we have a, a set of express, we have an expression over variables and we have to come up with an assignment that satisfy this expression. So, what are things we could do? You have a lot of variables, so you have to decide try to make an assignment on some variables, ok. So, you try to make an assignment on some variables. So, let us see initially you decide that I should make an assignment x set x to true, then I say I should assign y to true. I am just trying to come up with guesses, ok. What do I do? Then I pick another variable a and I say maybe let us assign a to true. So, can you look at the original formula and tell if you knew that a is true and if the original formula that is over here should be true, then what should happen? If a is true and we wanted to make the original formula evaluate to true, then what should definitely happen? x or y does not get troubled, right? A or B also is not trouble because being A being true everything is fine. What about not A or B? If I told you A is true, then B has to be true. So, well we could use the reasoning, we could say that B has to be true, but look at if A is true and B is true what happens? Not A or not B is false. So, what do you do? You say maybe I made a mistake in assigning A to true. So, you go on to do the same thing you say let me try to assign A to false. If I assign A to false, I again conclude that from here B has to be a false. If B is false, then again A and B both cannot be false at the same time. So, I keep doing this search and as you can see I go back I changed my mind, now I think I should assign y to false um, and then I again try to assign a to true, then a to false, I keep doing it 
and until I might reach a point where I conclude that there is no possible assignment over these variables. So, while this method is going to terminate and give a satisfying assignment, you can see that this is not going to be always a very good uh, method. In particular, there is something funny about here. It is making lot of choices over x and y, but if you were to look at this formula, you would realize that no matter what you make choices over x and y, there is no way to assign a and b in a way that you could what is called. The, so, now I am going to use some notation. So, each of these parentheses inside every parenthesis you have variable disjunction of variables or their negation. So, we are going to call this a clause. So, a set of clauses and we realize that there is no assignment over a and b that you could satisfy these four clauses and it has nothing to do with what assignments you are making over x and y. But this method of course, did not realize that um, trying to make choices over x and y is not very helpful. So, it would take a long long time and that mean that for the next 10 years or so nobody tried to really build algorithms practical tools building on this algorithm right. Um, if you if I tell you an algorithm that does not scale then you are not going to say that is a great idea let me also code it up and I also get a implementation a binary that also does not work. Um, so, there was a bit of a despair in the community and uh, now if we fast forward the timeline by late uh, 1960s Tony Hoare another logician looking at a different problem realized that well proving correctness of the program. So, at that time programming started to become very popular we started to come up with the programming language Algol and some of the early programming languages were formalized and one question was that how are we going to prove that these programs are correct. And uh, an important uh, breakthrough by Tony Hoare for which he received uh, the Turing award was to say that well you can formalize the correctness of programs by reducing it to theorem proving. What is what does the theorem proving mean? It means that you have a program you write here are all the premises and now you say that given these premises does something hold true which is the way we try to think of theorems. You when you are writing a theorem you say here are the set of assumptions from these assumptions does something uh, follow. That is kind of very similar to what we were looking at right. You are given set of premises from those premises uh, does a statement follow. The same uh, reasoning over Boolean uh, that we just discussed about. So, since Tony Hoare again identified the importance of this problem again people looked at this problem and this time instead of trying to come up with an algorithm that is going to work Cook and Levine's independently showed that this problem is NP complete. NP is the class of uh, problems where it is easy to check if I give a solution it is very easy to check if it satisfies O the if the formula evolves to 1 or not, but it turns out we do not know an efficient method to be able to find such assignment. So, if you just look at the two decades in the previous decade there was an attempt to come up with an algorithm. Now, we immediately identified that this problem is really hard. How hard it was? So, here is a quote I like from uh, Moshe Wadi who is a one of the most prominent uh, computer scientist of this generation. At he was a graduate student in 1970s and it was a really scary problem. If you come across set you turn your attention to somewhere else you do not try to solve the set problem. Let me tell you here is a very popular cartoon from uh, one of the uh, important book that was written. So, the cartoon is a little adapted and what the uh, programmer uh, or the engineer says that well I could not solve this problem, but you know this is an NP co a complete problem neither could all these other people do. So, at that point if you did not want to solve a problem you you would show that the problem is NP complete and then this was a very good excuse for you not to try to attempt solving the problem. So, a problem that went from being 
uh, giving hope for being able to reason to a problem that became a good excuse for not trying to solve it. In fact, towards the late 70s, one of uh, fairly controversial and uh, a paper appeared by De Milo, Lipton and Perlis, who said that, look, all of these are really hard problems. If this is your hope of proving correctness of programs, it is never going to work. So this is how we ended 70s, realizing that yes, you can formalize proving correctness of programs for certain properties into a problem, very well defined problem, but at the same time this is a really hard problem and there doesn't seem any hope of solving it. So in mid in the next decade, uh, Clark and Emerson, who were at uh, Harvard at that time and moved to CMU, said that, well, if this problem of verifying is very hard, then we are going to start small. So we are now going to look at systems where it is going to be possible to just do such verification without uh, looking at the entire generality of the problem. Okay? So s instead of trying to look at the any kind of formula or any kind of constraints, we started looking at constraints where the problem of satisfiability uh, or related problems would be easier. And that led to a lot of work on what are called binary decision diagrams. These are the uh, set of, these are the data structure that can represent constraints where the satisfiability problem turns out to be very easy. And then something happened. While the formal methods communities uh, began to contend with smaller things, at the same time, the computers became more and more complex. And in mid-90s, Intel released a chip, and uh, it had to recall the chip. Why so? Because there was a bug in one of the floating point uh, units. It cost a half a billion dollar. If something costs you half a billion dollars, then everybody, there's a lot of incentive to try to solve the problem. Um, we began to realize that even though the problem of verification is very hard, it can have disastrous effects if we are not going to solve it. So a European Space Agency uh, launched a rocket. Within 40 seconds, it crashed. Why so? Because there was a bug. So here we are, a problem that is hard. Over the years, we have figured out that the theory tells us it's very hard. Our experience also tells us it's very hard. We have failed to come up with really good algorithms. But if we don't solve the problem, it can have disastrous impact. And somehow when something becomes important, it, be it, it becomes part of the air, and here are uh, there was a graduate student, so this is just about the age, uh, you know, few years senior to most of you at that time, a graduate student in Michigan who, undaunted by the hardness of this problem, went back to look at this problem and said that maybe there's another way to look at the problem, maybe there's a way to design algorithm that can work, even though it is NP-complete. So what does NP-complete mean? There would be instances where so far we don't know if the if it is possible to solve such instances in polynomial time. But it doesn't mean that every instance is going to be hard. It doesn't mean that every set of constraints are hard. So maybe there is a hope to look at constraints, look at formulas uh, that come from practice, like the programs you write, the hardware you design, the systems you design, and for those, it might be possible to solve it efficiently. So let me tell you the insight uh, that came from Joao Marcos Silva along with his PSE advisor Karem Sakala. So let's go back to look at a formula here. Okay, so this formula is on set of variables, x, y, z, a, and b. Just like in the past, we make a decision on x, let's say we assign x to true, we assign y to true, and then we assign z to true. So if we assign z to true, what do we know? A has to be true, because if x is true, z is true, then the only way we could satisfy this clause is that A is true. But at the same time, if z is true, then B has to be true also. And if A and B both are true, then this clause is not satisfied. So we get what is called conflict. This is not a good idea. 
in the past we would say that, well, let's just go back and undo the previous decision that we did. But here, Marcus Silva and Sakala's idea was to say that, let us try to focus on how did we first reach into this conflict? What really caused us to get into this conflict? If I look at what caused us to get into this conflict, and I realized that it had nothing to do with assignment over Y. The reason that I am getting a conflict had nothing to do with the assignment over Y. It was really an assignment on X and Z that caused a conflict. Maybe I can remember the reason for this conflict. What's the reason for this conflict? That you should not assign X to true and G to true, because the moment you assign X to true and G to true, you are going to get conflict. How can I remember something? I can re rewrite this as a clause. So I can say that not X or not G. What can I do with this clause? I can put it in my database. So I can learn something and I can store it in my memory so that in future I never make such a mistake. I never assign X and G to be true. Now I am going to pretend. So, um, and <coughs> I can learn this clause. Turns out this clause that we are learning could have been also derived using just the rules of resolution. So resolution is a simple way of arguing, which is to say that if you have two clauses, not A or not B, and not G or B, then you could derive not A or not G. And similarly, with another clause, you will be able to derive not X or not G. So the same clause could be derived using resolution, but now there's a smart way of figuring out what things to resolve over. And now I learn this clause. I am going to ask myself, what would I have done differently if I knew this clause existed? So what I would have done differently is the moment I assign x to true, I would have immediately assign g to false. If this clause was there, right? So I backtrack, and now I say that when I assign x to true, I should assign g to false. This is a big jump, right? From just trying to undo your previous decision, you go back all the way where it, where, which was the place where you made the first mistake, and you are able to correct your mistake right there. So in, you went from where you could only try to fix locally to all the way back where you, would, uh, where you should have fixed if you knew all this information in advance. So this ability to remember the reasons for getting conflict and then being able to backtrack to the place where you could take actions if you knew that this was going to be there, this clause uh, was going to be present. So this idea it's very, if you look at this idea, it's very interesting that you could come up with such an idea just after your undergraduate, right? You look at uh, what is going on, you try to figure out, hey, based on it, what I sh should not do, you try to remember what you should not do, and now that you know what you shouldn't do, you go back to where you could take an action. And this is something I do want to convey that even though the problems can be very hard, when you are just starting out on your PhD journey, that's kind of the, one of the best time to attack a very hard problem. Because you don't get, you are undaunted, you don't know how hard it is, how hard it has been for a long time. And that's when uh, there are a lot of advances that come from people doing their PhD. Right after undergraduate, uh, there's a lot of potential for you to make breakthroughs. And this idea led to a lot of excitement in the uh, formal methods community. People started exploring all kind of uh, heuristics around the algorithm. You know, what are there other reasons you could deduce? Sometimes you might be just in a bad part of the search space, you should just restart, go in somewhere else, make some other decisions. And for the next four or five years, there was a lot of work, and we began to finally design uh, solvers that could handle small enough problems. But they couldn't still handle large problems. And at that, at that point, 
Sharad Malik, uh, who is a professor at uh, Princeton, he gave a bunch of undergraduates the set solver and he said, can you make it fast? And what they did is something that the research community wasn't doing for a long time. They profiled the solver. They said, okay, let me look at and let me try to profile the solver. And it turns out the solver was spending almost 80% of the time in doing these steps, the reasoning. Looks very simple, there is nothing tricky about it, but the data structures that were at, at that point were so slow that the solver was doing all the time in a step that looks like the easiest of all, right? Given the decisions you have made so far, what are the implications you have? It looks like the tricky part is what to decide on, what to learn, but you are spending all the time doing the simplest step. So these undergraduates went on to design really efficient, simple data structures that are still uh, at the core of all the set solvers that are out there. So this is also a very exciting problem where you can make advances. You don't even have to uh, be a PhD student to make advances in this field. So how impactful uh, these advances have been? So very soon after the uh, paper from uh, Marcus Silva and Sakala, uh, researchers at uh, CMU, Carnegie Mellon University figured out that instead of spending all the time trying to deal with those binary decision diagrams, the data structure or the set of formulas we were dealing with because they were, for those the problem of satisfiability was easy, we can now really look at the full general class of formulas and use these powerful set solvers. And once we started using these powerful set solvers, very soon all the companies have integrated that, uh, the solvers into uh, their uh, tool chain. As we are speaking, the companies are running uh, thousands of servers trying to find bugs in all kinds of devices that we use, the device drivers, uh, the software, that we rely on the Amazon web services to make sure that your data isn't leaked every time you log in. All of these, a lot of this work is being done by these set solvers. In the research community, Clark Emerson Sifakis for, uh, received the Turing Award for the line of work they started in 1980s that finally became really practical. Don Knuth, who is uh, one of uh, the most famous computer scientist in mid 2010s wrote an entire book all about discussing how set solvers work. And he put it very nicely that set became from kind of what looked like an abstract exercise just about 20 minutes ago when we started um, our presentation. So it went from being an abstract exercise to becoming a really powerful and practical tool. And these solvers can now handle problems that we thought were hopeless, you know, just about a few years ago. So the set revolution that uh, we could get finally allowed us to be able to start verifying, certifying that the systems are correct, right? So a decade ago, here at IIT Bombay, along with Moshe Wadi, we started asking that now that problem that we thought is going to be really hard is no longer a problem, it is time to look beyond satisfiability. So what are problems beyond satisfiability you can uh, look at? So think about set. Set is a problem saying that here are a set of constraints, is there an assignment that satisfies these constraints? In what kind of scenarios you ask such questions? You say that here is a system, does it have a leakage? But now you could ask, how much information leakage is there? Is it too much? Is it just a little bit that I can tolerate? You are designing uh, powerful systems these days that help you to make decisions. Are they fair? How fair they are? How robust these systems are? When you put these systems into critical infrastructure, how resilient these infrastructure become? So the questions that come here, the core of these questions are all about quantifying how often a system satisfies the property. So we can go from the question of saying, does the system satisfy property always to asking how often the system satisfies the property. 
why do we care about such problems? So, let me talk, uh, talk to you about one application that we have explored in the last few years. So, we began working with civil engineers at uh, Rice University. Rice is located in Houston. Houston is prone to hurricanes. And if you have ever been caught in one, you know it is no fun to be stuck in a hurricane and also not have power. So, it is important for the city authorities to have access to tools and techniques that can predict the effect of natural disaster. So, the key problem we started looking at here was that, well, what is the likelihood of a blackout due to a natural disaster? Let me put the problem much more in computer science terms. You have a power grid, some nodes generate power, some node we are interested in a particular node T and we want to compute the, we can assign failure probability to every edge. So, in a edge failing in the real world corresponds to a power link getting destroyed because of high wind and you are interested in computing what is the probability a node gets disconnected from the set of sources. The power of logical formalism is that you can encode such things just using constraints. You can write a constraint that says what does it mean to, uh, for things to be disconnected. It is very easy to write such constraints and now the problem of computing this probability is that of counting. So, you are asking you write these constraints and once you count the number of how many things satisfy these constraints, you can uh, compute answer to your original probability question. You can use similar idea for uh, uh, these powerful neural networks out there. They are really powerful, but at the same time they can be brittle to small perturbations. So, you could ask uh, to quantify how often it is the case that if you make a small perturbation, the network is going to give a different answer. Again, you, you see the network, you can write the constraints logical constraints to encode the behavior. Similar ideas that we knew by the late uh, 1960s, you can write the behavior of the neural network using constraints. Now, the problem of quantifying how often it happens is that of counting. You could also reason, use this to reason about properties such as fairness, where you want to quantify how often it is the case that if you were to change uh, someone's, uh, let us say you have a person and if they had a different gender, then the machine learning system would make a different out, a prediction. So, you want to quantify how fair these systems are. So, for all such properties, these problems reduce to that of counting. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the precise methods uh, that go on to developing to give you a flavor of the kind of problems uh, that you might be working on if you were to take research in formal methods. So, now I will give you little bit more concrete details. So, the problem we have, we have a formula or set of variables. The soul of f is to denote the set of solutions of this formula. The problem of satisfiability was to ask is there an assignment that satisfies these constraints. The problem of counting is to ask how many assignments there are that satisfy these constraints. So, if you were to take a simple formula x 1 or x 2, how many assignments there are that satisfy these constraints? 3. The only assignment that does not satisfy this constraint is when you assign x 1 and x 2 to 0 0. This problem turns out to be very hard in theory. So, we are often interested in the approximate variance of this problem, where we would like to compute a epsilon delta approximation for this problem. And to give you a flavor of just to give a sense of uh, how much work there is to be uh, we have been doing and there is to be done. In 2012 when we started looking at this problem, you could see that there were some techniques that could scale to large instances, but would not provide any kind of guarantees. And there were techniques that could provide really strong guarantees, but could not scale to large instances. So, the work that we have been doing for the past decade is to design techniques that can scale to large instances and at the same time provide rigorous guarantees. So, let me discuss a little bit about the kind of techniques uh, one ends up developing. I will motivate by a simple example. So, suppose you wanted to count how many people in Mumbai like coffee. So, this is the kind of counting problem. Uh, the population of Mumbai is 12.5 million. We could encode every person using a 24 bit identifier and we wanted to figure out how many people in Mumbai like coffee. So, how would you go about counting how many people like coffee? You sample. Is this going to always work? 
Ah, yes. <laughs> so, if you pick about 50 people and you can say how many people like coffee and scale, what if there are only 1000 people who like coffee? In that case, if there are only 1000 people who like coffee, we are not going to find them in our sample of 50 people and we will give a really wrong answer. If we find somebody, then we will give an answer in hundreds of thousands and that is also very bad. And this is precisely where we want to rely on the power of set solvers. So, a set query here in an abstract sense is to say find me a person who likes coffee. You have a constraint that the person should like coffee and find me a person who likes coffee. The solvers are powerful, so they can allow you to answer query like find me a person who likes coffee and the person is not uh, person Y and find me another person and so on. So, if you had these powerful solvers, you could ask them to enumerate all the people who like coffee. If there are only 50 people, that is going to work uh, well, you could enumerate all the people who like coffee, but what if everybody likes coffee? In that case, we will end up making exponentially many queries. So, can we come up with a method that could do with you know maybe linear in n or logarithmic in n many queries. Remember the number n is the number of bits. So, the number of people who like coffee can be anywhere between you know 0 and 2 to the n and we want to do with just a linear or logarithmically many queries. So, let me get into kind of the core of the techniques that we have developed. Um, if you look at this this blue circle and you imagine this to be the space of all possible assignments. So, in our case this is the space of all possible people in Mumbai and the dots are people who like coffee. So, what if we could partition the space of people or in our case space of assignments into cells, so that the number of solutions in every cell is roughly equal. In our coffee case, the number of people in every cell who like coffee are roughly equal and the number of solutions is small enough that you could go and pick a random cell, you could enumerate everybody who likes coffee in that cell and scale the count by the number of cells you have and that would give the precisely the kind of strong guarantees we might be after. Okay? So, the idea is that if you could partition into cells that are roughly equal, by roughly equal I mean the number of solutions across cells are roughly equal and the cells are small enough that you could enumerate all the solutions in a cell. As Oma indicated that how can we partition without assuming anything about the distribution of solutions. So, the first challenge that we embarked upon is that how can we do such a partitioning and the second challenge is uh, which will become very clear soon is how many cells should be partitioned into. So, here is how you go about addressing the first challenge. We are here interested in designing a function that maps assignments to cells and these are hash functions. As you can see that if you had a deterministic hash function then it is unlikely to work because maybe everybody who likes coffee is in one of the cell. So, you rely on the power of randomness. So, that if you were to choose a function from a large family of hash function, a function randomly, then such a function could partition the space of solutions into cells that are roughly equal and small with high enough probability. Are there such function that can do so? Turns out the work of Carter and Wegman from 1977 showed that there are such functions. Let me show you what these functions look like. They look they are one of the simplest functions you can think of. So, you want to construct a function that maps assignments over n variables to cells that can be represented by m bits. You choose m random xor, xor is just addition modulo 2. How do you choose every xor? Well, just choose every variable with probability half and you xor them together. How do you choose one of the cells? You can just set each of these xors to 0 or 1 randomly and independently. Now, the solutions uh, that you are after is the original formula conjuncted with these m x r's you have we have put together. And these functions precisely they give the guarantee that you do not have to assume anything about the distribution of solutions. If you were to just choose random x r's conjunct with the formula, then these random x r's are able to partition um, into cells that are roughly equal. How many cells should we partition into? So, as you can see that we want all the cells to be small 
So if we had lot of solutions, we would have to partition to many cells. If we have few solutions, then we will partition to fewer cells. But we don't know how many solutions we have in advance. Well, a very simple idea works. You start with the original formula and you ask, is the number of solutions at least threshold? You can answer this question by just enumerating solutions. You ask for the first solution, then the second solution and so on. You don't have to count. You have to just figure out if there are threshold plus one solutions. The moment there are threshold plus one solutions, the answer is no. When you partition into two cells, you pick one of them, you ask the same question again. If the answer is still no, you go on to you partition further and further until you reach a point where the number of solutions is indeed less than threshold. And at that time, your estimate is the number of solutions in the cell times the total number of cells you have partitioned into. And this gives the kind of guarantees one is interested in. These are the guarantees called epsilon delta guarantees. So you have two parameters, epsilon to indicate how much error tolerance you want and delta to indicate the confidence. So the estimate you get is within one plus epsilon factor with confidence at least one minus delta. More importantly, the number of calls you are making are just logarithmic in n. So what we could do finally, we could start building a tool and we could uh, handle reasonable programs or the power grids of reasonable size. And one of the interesting observations in this field is that if you build a tool that starts scaling to good enough problems, then there are more problems where further scalability is required. So over past few years, uh, we have been, and when I say we in general, the community has been focused on making advances along three axes. Um, you develop better theory, better algorithms, and software development. So how can you come up with uh, good hash functions that work well with the solvers? How do you develop solvers that can do such reasoning? And how do you make the algorithmic improvements? So if one were to work in this area, then there is a lot of opportunity to work along. A, you can choose your own quadrant where you want to work. You can, if you want to work in theory, this is the area to work on. If you want to work on designing algorithms, here is the area to work on. If you want to work on building software uh, tools, this is where you should work on. If you want to work at the intersection of the two, that's exactly what uh, this area is made for. Let me tell you how much advance you can make by uh, making progress on problems uh, in uh, this research area. So this is a problem of figuring out crit you are given a power grid. You want to know what is the probability a node gets disconnected in case of hurricane or not. I'm going to show you experiments for one of the cities from South Carolina. On y-axis, we have the time. And on x-axis, we have the, all the terminal nodes labeled. As you can see, this is an important problem. So there's a lot of work that has gone mostly in the engineering community. and those techniques would consistently time out for all such terminals. So they would not be able to come up with an estimate that has the rigorous guarantees. The technique that I just discussed to you, one can use it to give an estimate which is uh, with theoretical guarantees consistent in less than 150 seconds. This is just one application that I uh, mentioned about. Uh, the tool that we started working here um, 10 years ago, it's called AproxMC. It's open source. And it has been used for all kinds of different applications. For example, automating the ciphertext attacks, in case of bioinformatics, uh, sampling transmission networks, uh, quantifying the software reliability uh, for binarized neural networks, and so on. So where do we go from here? Well, as I mentioned, that in the field of formal methods, you have this virtuous cycle. If you build a scalable tool, then there are more applications, and there's a demand for further scalability. So you just, every time you are on this iteration of the cycle again and again. So now that we have a scalable tool, there is even more demand for applications. So much more scalability needs to be attained. Um, if you were to put a perspective, you, I would say that today's counters are somewhere where the set solvers in early 2000s. That was really the time when all those big major breakthroughs came in. So we are poised to 
build much more scalable counters and it's going to require breakthroughs in theory, practice and systems. And also it is going to be really crucial that we succeed in this aim. Why so? Well, one of the thing about counting, it can allow us to reason about statistical systems. So instead of just asking, is it ever the case, you are able to quantify how often it is the case. That's the formulation that makes sense in case of statistical systems. And these statistical systems are going to be adopted very soon in our lives. Every day now we are beginning to see how statistical systems are becoming more powerful, more and more companies are going to adopt, we are going to interact with them. And if they are going to be everywhere, we are going, these companies and we, uh, the community at large is going to have one of these Pentium 4 moments where you are going to ship something and it's going to cost billions of dollars, you are going to recall it or we are going to uh, kill a uh, lot of people or uh, and in all such cases there is a chance that we can prevent and if we have to prevent we better be able to design such techniques. So I think from my perspective we need another 100 factor speed up before these all of these counters can again be adopted in the industry. And so here are uh, three challenge problems that I wanted to uh, list for you to get excited about. So today we can handle power grid of a small to medium sized city in US. Can we handle a power grid of the city of the size of LA? We can handle neural networks with few thousands of neurons. As you know that is not sufficient. Can we at least get to the point in the next five years where we can handle small enough neural networks that are going to be deployed in uh, devices uh, such as your uh, lap, uh, uh, mobile phones. Similarly, in case of software engineering, can we do the information flow analysis for small at least medium scale programs. Um, how are we going to get there? Well, it is going to require us to make advances along theory, algorithms and software development. The same recipe that has helped the community to make progress over the past three uh, decades. Where to start? Um, since I started here, I do not have any better recommendation to start at ID Bombay. Uh, with that, I am going to conclude. I am happy to take any questions here. No, the techniques uh, do not have an assumption about the uh, solution space because uh, for the random XR, the <coughs> universal hash functions work on any, uh, any solution space. So, there is no underlying assumption for the theory to work. Uh, this, let us go get to the other part of the software because you want to make sure that the set calls can be handled by the solvers. So, the solvers do not really make an assumption they are based on the CDCL paradigm which is not really trying to exploit the product structure that is. So, I think in both cases uh, I do not think that is a bottleneck. Yeah, that is a very good point. So, remember the no problem is still in quotes. I do not mean to claim that you can solve every formula out there, right. There are going to be instances where these solvers are not going to be able to handle. Um, what does turn out that lot of a problem that arise from practice where the solvers can scale very well. So, that is uh, one uh, important perspective to have. The second is where there is a lot of work to do is because you have access to these solvers that are incredibly powerful, but at the same time limiting they cannot handle every kind of instance. So, the algorithm that you are uh, you have to develop have to make sure that you are querying them in a particular manner. So, that is what um, you know the traditional complexity theory does not care about. So, that is why there is a lot of scope and work to do in algorithmic engineering here that how do you come up with the queries that can be really handled well by these solvers. Finally, to your point you are right we are interested in handling problems that arise from practice and there is a lot of uh, structure in such problems. So, there is a uh, lot of work um, that we have been doing and others have been doing in the community is trying to use machine learning to guide the search for heuristics. So, you want to because the way we end up designing heuristics you look at a pattern just like we looked at a pattern that may be what we should do is to come up with a reason and store it. So, it is all about looking at the patterns and this is where uh, doing data driven methods 
can be very helpful. So there's a, uh, in, in many ways you can uh, use machine learning to help the guide of, uh, guide the development of this formal method techniques. And then you use formal method techniques to be able to uh, give the guarantees about the robustness of these machine learning methods. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done at the intersection of the two. Um, if you, once you understand much more about these techniques, then uh, the space of problems you can attack becomes more broad because you are not just trying to look for a classification problem. You know what problem you should be handling inside the formal method technique. So uh, one way to approach these problems is to understand more about the inner workings of these solvers and then you start seeing a lot of opportunity for using data driven methods. So um, yeah, to summarize one thing I do want to give you, uh, working in this area you end up working on all, all the related uh, areas of computer science, developing a, a theory, algorithm, software development, while at the same time trying to develop a tangible object that others are able to use and uh, have impact in practice. Yeah, so uh, in fact, um, you know, these Monte Carlo techniques where you have the one hour uh, and the probability dependence, you, we did uh, uh, compare with those approaches and um, it just takes a long time because in practice you don't want to design systems that fail very often, no, at least not the engineers uh, in a real world. So, uh, so that's kind of one of the reasons that uh, these techniques tend to perform very well over the systems where the failure probability is very, very small. If it is large, then any kind of Monte Carlo method uh, works well. Mm, yeah. Ah, so Yes, these problems, the kind of problems we are considering are our finite domain. Uh, there are no infinite, the, the problem is very fixed finite. There are a set of variables and you are asking, you know, how many solutions there are or can it be satisfied. So since the entire such space is finite, it's possible to, here's a very simple way, you could just go over everything and check if uh, it satisfies or not. So that's where it differs from problems where, uh, you know, uh, the space is infinite. Yes, and at the same time, I mean, uh, most of the systems we design, the memory is finite, the systems we are designing, uh, the time is finite that you are going to run this system. So the properties you want to verify are also in the finite setting. Uh, so there's a lot to do in finite setting. Sorry? Yeah. Uh, for concurrent programs? Uh, yeah, there is a, a lot of work uh, that focuses on, you know, for, uh, there's an entire work on using partial order reductions and the entire area that focuses on these problems, where you still make the final queries. So, the lot of work is in developing algorithm that can make queries to the set solvers or there, now there are slightly more powerful reasoning engines called SMT solvers, satisfiability modular theory. So you are, instead of just trying to reduce the entire problem, you want to come up with an algorithm. So treat, you have access to a powerful but limited, at the same time very limiting uh, box that you can query. So you want to design an algorithm that makes few queries in a smart manner that you can answer your original problem. So the most of the approaches are not usually monolithic. That's why there's a lot of algorithmic engineering to do, which is that there are certain kind of queries you can make to the solvers while there are other queries the solvers are going to take a long time. So the no problem is in quotations, okay? So that's kind of the key and exciting uh, avenue to work on. Oh, not just puzzles uh, that you solve on a Sunday morning. The solvers are used to solve uh, mathematics problem that we have been stuck for uh, almost 100 years. There's a lot of work. You can formalize a mathematics problem. You know, a problem, uh, you should Google something called Pythagorean triples. We couldn't solve for 100 years. 
Then Marine Hule at CMU said that, well, we have access to these powerful solvers. You encode the problem as a set problem, and the solver returns the answer. So, um, yeah, your Sunday morning puzzles are all gone. Yeah, I mean, right now, most of these solvers are used for problems where you, you put some finite domains. So, if, um, you know, there are there's still a lot of problems within the finite domain to work on. So, uh, there is, of course, a work building on top of the set solvers for reasoning about, you know, theorems that are true over infinite space. Uh, Fermat's last theorem still requires a lot of work to do. And uh, I think that's kind of the exciting part, right? Eventually, you should be able to prove everything that you could uh, in an automated manner. Yeah, um, of course, uh, we had to discuss the encoding offline. But one thing to state here is, you know, a lot of fairness problems. I'm showing a formulation that is called individual fairness. So here you are interested in asking that if you were to take a person and if you were to just change the race, then will the network give a different output? And you want to quantify because the systems, as all of us have figured out that there are always corner cases you can find. So what are you going to do? If there are, every system has corner cases, then you are going to use the one that more often than not doesn't, uh, co doesn't discriminate, right? So you want to quantify how often it is the case that if you were to change the sensitive attribute, the network would not give a different output. And this becomes the counting problem here. So if you encode the neural network, just in the same recipe that we did in the past uh, of, you know, networks are just programs. You can use programs, you can encode them in logic. And now it reduces to a counting problem. Yeah. Thank you for all the questions. Uh, any further questions, you can take it up offline and leave it to us. So next. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you.